Welcome to Uncomfortable, conversations about culture and Christianity. My name is Eric, and today I am joined by Rachel. Hey, everyone. Welcome back, Rachel. You've been gone for a couple I'm weeks. I'm back. I've missed it. I've yeah. missed you guys. People are glad to have you back. I'm what have sure. you been doing? Just living my life, doing Just, some fun stuff. You have a life outside the podcast. I do. That's I actually do. <laughs> the <laughs> other voice you hear is Alex. Hey. Welcome. Good to be How's here. How's it going? And then we have, well. we have a guest, again, another guest. This might be the most special guest, though. <laughs> I mean, you're paid the, to say that. that yeah. uh, the 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 one, the only, Mark Ashton. Uh, welcome to your debut on the Uncomfortable Podcast. Thanks. Yeah, it's good to be a first timer here, and greetings to all those who are listening. Awesome. Uh, we have kind of a ritual when we have a guest on, and we ask them three questions. <laughs> oh, uh, and you know. You, just so everyone knows, you, you were not, you didn't get a pre screen these three questions. Right. So, uh, want them answered honestly. Uh, have you ever had a nickname? And if so, what was it or is it? Mm, I've had a lot of nicknames uh, over the time. I could give you a, a few of them. Uh, one of them was given to me by Jason Noto, who lived across the street and two doors down when I was probably 10 years old, and he was the age of my older brother. And, you know, people in middle school, they just love to taunt uh, younger kids. So he just called me Mark the Narc that sat on a spark and burned his Clark in the park. <laughs> okay. So that I sounds just, like a loaded nickname. <laughs> it's a <laughs> riddle nickname. Yeah. And I just want to know what my Clark is, you know. Yeah. And given that I sat on a spark, I think it's obvious. But. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's a guy who's got a name for my tuchus when I'm 10 years old. Uh, All right. Yeah. That's wow. awesome. You said this is uncomfortable. Am I, am I uncomfortable enough already? <laughs> I, right off. I've always wanted to know the nickname for my pastor's tushy. Uh, <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm really honored today. Uh, Secrets uh, out. <laughs> hopefully that chair is comfortable on your Clark. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. If you had a warning label, what would yours be? Oh, my goodness. If I had a warning label, I don't know. Uh, warning, Mark Ashton nuclear and volatile okay wow he will wreck your life in one way or another wow okay yeah. that's that's i do explosive. think you know as a side note i think that one of the roles of preaching is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable and <laughs> wow. so you that's know good. it could be warning afflictor ahead if you're feeling pretty comfortable yeah i want to mess with you wow that's good <laughs> that is very good all right this one's easy uh what's the last book that you read uh, last book that I finished, or because I'm in the middle of about three right now. Let's but, say the one you finished. Last book I finished was a book called uh, Factfulness, and it was written by a Swedish uh, a World Health Organization expert, a uh, secular book by a guy who was just very concerned about what people believe about the status of the world. And so he talked about a, quite a variety of statistics that are out there. He gives people quizzes on, you know, how well you know what's happening in the world. And the interesting thing is that most people get like less than 25% right uh, on the quizzes that he gives on typical facts related to the world. Mm -hmm. So it's things about like death rates and what's happening with population control and uh, poverty and how that changes birth rates and all kinds mm -hmm. of very interesting things. Uh, I would give it an all-star recommendation. In fact, I gave it to our entire missions team after I got back because it was so paradigm shifting for me. Uh, I think that we have a tendency to believe really bad news about the world, and there's actually a lot of things in that arena that are getting way better, mm. and so it was a very fun read for me. So cool. you said you're in the middle of three books. Are you a, in the middle of a bunch of books kind of person, or do you like to do one at a time and finish them all? I am very much an in, in the middle of a bunch of books kind of person. <laughs> yeah. And some of it depends, you know, in, in my uh, month off in July, I can read through a book. Mm. But when I'm working, I'm always prepping for something. Mm -hmm. So right now, you know, I'm partway through a book on Acts, which is what we're doing our message series on. I'm partway through a book on Paul because I'm taking people on a, a trip to Greece to go in the footsteps of Paul. And uh, I got a couple of leadership books that I'm working through, and it just depends on what's what's kind of happening for me. Mm -hmm. And so I'll pick up and put down books a lot. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the book you said you just finished? Just so we Factfulness. missed it. Factfulness. Factfulness. Yeah. There it is. All right. Great. Uh, okay. Well, let's uh, let's really kind of get to the meat of it all here. Uh, what's you know we kind of want to know like what is it like kind of from your personal perspective of being a pastor of this church i mean it could be any church but we're obviously talking about christ community church um i know i mean it's multi-generational it's 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 large especially i mean 
at f- where we are in Omaha. It's a very large church. Uh, and then all your other various, you know, responsibilities around that. I th- the last two weeks, uh, we dived into grief and we um, met with a couple of women who had lost children. And, you know, they, they talked about how you spoke into their lives during those times and what role you played. And I think, you know, Alex, you mentioned how it's like, you kind of have this realization of there's a lot more that goes on than just mm. getting up on the stage on Sunday and delivering a message. Yeah, well, there's a lot involved there. Let me let me first of all say, just kind of as a caveat, is I've loved seeing the way this podcast has rolled. So I just kind of want to say publicly, at least to the podcast audience, I'm really glad that you guys are doing this. I think this is a great way to help accelerate people's faith. You guys are doing a great job with it. And especially these last two weeks, oh my goodness, listening to these podcasts was deeply impacting. Mm-hmm. Even though I walked through the stories, I still kind of recried through the stories mm-hmm. and was able to enter into uh, Shaka and Carly's worlds that, in a way that was really powerful. And it was powerful the first time, but it's powerful again. And yeah. I just recommend, if you're listening to this podcast and haven't heard the last two, go back, listen to the last two, because they're really, really good. Um, yeah, leading, uh, leading at Christ Community in general. So a large multi-generational church, for me, it's a ball to be able to have this job. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a dream come true job for me. One of the great things about being in a large church is that you get to specialize according to what your passion areas are and what your giftings are. And so me, you know, leadership is in my wheelhouse, teaching is in my wheelhouse, helping people to connect with God is in my wheelhouse. So I feel like in general, I get to do what I do best every single day. And uh, I show up at work and there is always a fresh challenge. Uh, For a lot of my, you know, ministry life, every four years or so, I kind of get bored. And uh, it's like, ah, what's gonna be the next challenge for me? And I'm looking for something to do. And if I'm bored, I make trouble. Well, in this job, I am never bored. Uh, There is always more challenge than I can keep up with. And so I keep on running hard after the next thing and the next thing. And uh, being at a place like Christ Community, that's such a high impact community with people who are so biblical, so filled with love, so filled with vision, it's just like keeping up with what God is doing. And so it creates a very exciting environment to be able to do ministry. I love it. I love what I get to do. Yeah, I think that's one of the cool things about being here, and I think you probably wouldn't have a problem saying this, otherwise it, things will get really awkward, is like, you're not even the smartest, you're the lead pastor, not even the smartest person that shows up here on Sunday mornings, That's you right. know? Not so even there's, close. there's challenges even in that, knowing that you're the one, because I think a lot of people think with the pastor, you've got the pulpit and you know everything. I was mm-hmm. sitting in my journey group last night and a new couple came and that was kind of like her impressions of pastors is like, you better have every answer. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you've come to the wrong place. Exactly. And so that's one of the fun challenges. Would have been some of like those, maybe as you started, those like butt head moments, not butt head moments, but butting head <laughs> moments. I have both of those. Yes. <laughs> Either or uh, where you where you kind of realized I wasn't the smartest person in a room or in a, get after mm. giving a sermon or anything like that. Mm. Yeah, I got I got a lot of examples of that. So one of them is uh, when I was first starting here. Uh, some people know this. I have never taken a class in Greek, in ancient you know Koine Greek that a lot of pastors have, so they can read the New Testament on their own. But I'm really pretty good at reading commentaries and reading people who read Greek, and then you know I'll use the Greek words in a sermon in a way that's helpful, but hopefully not too ap- academic. Well, when I first came, uh, I was doing that. I was dropping a few of these in sermons, and I would meet with Carl Pagenkamper, who really does speak Greek, Dr. Yeah. Carl Pagenkamper, I'll add in. And, uh, you know, he would coach me the morning after, and he would say, you know, that Greek word really doesn't mean that. You know, I don't know where you got that. And I'd tell him the commentary I got it from. I don't know where you got that, but, you know, it's, it's actually a little bit different. After about his fourth time doing that, he said, you know, you should probably drop the Greek for a while. Just, you know, <laughs> you'd be better off just keeping it down the fast lane. And so <laughs> that was one moment. But I would say I'm aware every week. Uh, when I show up, that whatever subject I'm talking about, there's somebody in the room who's a bigger expert on that subject than I am. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about Bible, if we're talking about philosophy, if we're talking about uh, psychology or theology or science, there's somebody in the room who knows way more than me, which is great accountability for me to say, I'm going to keep things in a lane that really is credible, make sure I do my homework well. Uh, Two weeks ago, you guys might remember, I started with kind of a weird intro about string theory. And I had a very high awareness that there's going to be string theory experts who are in the room, you know, 
professors and students and so forth. And I probably had five people come up to me afterwards and talk about the semester long class they had in string theory or the things that they're learning in string theory. They're way more advanced than what I know. And so you just kind of have to have the humility to realize there are smart people around me all over. It's good. It's good. So I wanted to ask a question. One thing that I've been learning being a resident here of just um, being in ministry is a little bit of a different job than just like a regular kind of nine to five. You go to work, you do some some tasks and you come home and you kind of leave work at work. It's I'm learning that ministry is very different in that aspect. And so a lot of things that I do in ministry come home and I'm not just sharing with my husband, but he's also getting involved. And so mm-hmm. it's it's only it's almost like a family affair if you work in ministry. So I kind of want to ask, what are some things that um, have impacted your wife or your kids if you've been in ministry and, and how do you guys as a family do ministry together? Woo, yeah, that's a big question. Uh, overall, it's fantastic, I think, at Christ Community to be a pastor's family. Uh, our kids are treated really well. You know, we give them these special little treats and experiences that are behind the scenes kind of stuff that only pastor kids get. And so <laughs> they love that. Our kids have uh, generally had really good experiences relationally here as well. Uh, they're at the church more often than ordinary kids uh, would be, and so they tend to have deeper relationships and really strong foundations. So that's been great. Mm. Uh, I try really carefully not to carry the stresses of church at home, uh, but I know I don't do that successfully all the time. So if I'm having a really heavy day, I'm working through a hard crisis, uh, it's probably like a lot of jobs that have an emotional toll on them that I can carry that home with me, either in terms of being withdrawn or uh, cranky or whatever uh, with my family. So Kelly sometimes gets the brunt of if I'm experiencing things uh, hard at the church. Uh, we had, when Kelly and I first came, we had some really clear conversations with the elders about what would and would not be expected of Kelly mm-hmm. in ministry. Yeah. At the time, we had four small kids from age two two to 11. And the basic thing was, well, nothing that wouldn't be required of a normal mother of four kids that would be coming here. Mm Because part of her ministry was to be a single mom on Sunday mornings and uh, just make sure our kids were taken care of so that I could be uh, free. And Kelly's an extraordinary person who carried a load beyond that. But I would say now that our youngest is 16 years old, man, she's got a lot of freedom to be involved in ministry. She can do whatever she wants. She's actually got four ministries that she's connected in. And uh, there's all the ups and downs that go with that. So the ups would be tremendous impact, tremendous friendships. The downs are, you know, when people are mean or leave the church poorly, Mm. it actually affects Kelly worse than it affects me. And I think the reason is because Uh, When I experience it, I get to experience the pain, and then I get to experience the reconciliation and all the conversations along the way. Kelly gets to hear it when I get back home, and then I talk about the reconciliation, but she wasn't there to experience that. And emotionally, it's just, it's, I think it's more hard on a spouse of a pastor or spouse of a church staff than it is on the, on the uh, staff themselves. Okay, so speaking of that, this is kind of in the same vein. Uh, what's what's the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you on stage when <laughs> you're preaching? Oh man, well, something you're willing to dig up. Maybe. I was going to say there's ordinary mess ups that happen all the time. You know, I, I make mouthographical errors almost every Sunday. <laughs> And uh, you know they used to keep compilations of those and show them at staff meetings and so forth that were uh, that were pretty hilarious. Wow, keeping you humble there, huh? Yeah, yeah. but I do remember one time uh, when I was in the gym. Uh, this time, I was uh, I was speaking on the stage, and one of my helpers was uh, there in the front row and had a little sign that she was holding up. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to ignore it because sometimes my little helpers are just messing with me. You know, they uh, <laughs> they come and they, you know, usually they're trying to help, but sometimes they'll do practical jokes. I thought it was that until I looked down and it said, your fly is down. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and so you think about it and I could feel the draft. I mean, it was not just like halfway <laughs> down. It was really, really down. <laughs> And so I stopped, and this is the only thing I could think to do, you know, in the moment. I physically stopped talking, turned around, zipped my fly with kind of a little jump, because everybody in the room knew it was down except for me. Like, I was the (laughs) only one who was clueless on that one, and then awkwardly continued on with my message. Uh, (laughs) Well, there it is. That's, I mean, I, you know, I was really hoping for something like that. It's it's uncomfortable. (laughs) It's uncomfortable, uncomfortable, so... Probably more for everyone else than you, <laughs> <Yeah>. actually. <laughs> so I, th- I, th- 
I think one of the the interesting dichotomies of being a good communicator, which you are from stage, I think people will they'll feel like you're their best friend over weeks and weeks and years and years of just hearing mm-hmm. you talk and mm-hmm. speak. It's mm-hmm. like they might not know you on a personal level, but they feel like they do. They've heard your stories. They And what what is that like? How do you how do you kind of deal with that? Because I think sometimes people might approach you like they know you for they've known you for years yeah. and they think that maybe they have a, a closer relationship than you really do. Mm-hmm. Like, well, there's a lot of things. Uh, try to try to know people's names really well and use it whenever you can is uh, one piece that's helpful. Uh, be really good at faking it <laughs> when when you know that there's somebody who knows you and you have no idea who they are. Uh, be as sincere as possible and also apologize. You know, I know I should know the answer to this question. I'm so sorry I don't, but can you remind me of your situation or can you remind me of uh, your name or whatever the case uh, may be? I have one story uh, that, that was kind of interesting along those lines. Went to a dinner party at a family from the church's house. It was our first time getting into their house. We were really just getting to know them. And it was a delightful time uh, that we had together that night. And as we were leaving, uh, they said the same kind of dynamic that you're talking about. I feel like we know you really well because we see you on stage all the time and we know all of your stories and so forth. And I said, yeah, sociologists have done a study on that. It's called false intimacy. It's where Mm. people feel like you're intimate, but you're really not that intimate at all. (laughs) And Kelly's jaw just about hit the ground. (laughs) She was like, that was so rude. I had to go back, (laughs) apologize to them and... Oh. Anyway, <laughs> are they still at the church? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. No, they're not. It was about a year later that they moved on to another church in Omaha. Oh, on some new false intimacy, I, I guess. I don't think that there was a correlation between those things. Okay, but, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> kind of in the same vein of that, too. How do you figure out what your capacity is for different levels of relationships within a church like this? I mean, there's obviously going to be people that you want to be really close with and have those intimate deep relationships with but then there's so many other people how do you figure out what's my capacity here where where do these people fit in in relationships with me yeah that's that's actually a huge challenge i mean that's mm-hmm. one of the the biggest challenges i would say about leading a large church is that you know an ordinary human has maybe capacity for 8 to 10 close intimate relationships and it doesn't matter how big the organization is that you lead you still have capacity for about eight to ten close Mm -hmm. relationships Uh, but you want to serve people really well you want to love people well so when we've got a staff team of 50 or 60 people and then 20 residents that are here and 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people to boot on top of that Mm. uh, the desire is hey I want to be friends with everybody and uh, I want to do my very best to try and get up close and personal with everybody that I possibly can, but there are just limits to your humanity. I mean, there's just only so many hours in a day, only so many relationships that you can have. Uh, fortunately, you know, one of the gifts God has given me is I'm, I'm wildly extroverted. So mm-hmm. on all of those tests and scales and so forth, I have almost an unlimited capacity for being with people and I get more energized by that. And so, you know, I can really do meetings all day long and come home and have a journey group and all those kinds of things. And it's it's great for me. Mm -hmm. So I would say my lid is is pretty high uh, compared to most people. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that serves that serves really well in uh, being able to do that. And I genuinely love being around people, investing in them, developing Mm -hmm. leaders, helping them in their faith. And so it's not nearly as challenging when you say, hey, I get to do this. I get to do this thing next. And. It's a joy. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, go for it. Sweet. I, I'm curious, like, what if if the people that are listening that probably are have seen you preaching on Sunday mornings? We don't have, you know, they don't have a lot of relationship with you. What's one thing that you think would just shock people? Maybe not shock, but at least surprise people about you and your day to day life, like uh, something you love that's a little quirky or something you do that's quirky or mm. a passion of yours that people are like, I would never see a lead pastor or li- that lead pastor liking those kinds of things. Hmm. Something that's quirky, huh? I am having a hard time coming up with something that's really or just surprising it doesn't have to be weird just surprising to <laughs> to the average person so yeah i'll say a couple of things i'm a pretty proficient juggler most okay. people uh oh, wouldn't, wow. wouldn't have guessed that that when i was in high school and college i was on a circus stunts team 
and uh, became a proficient juggler. And so oftentimes, you know, if I'm taking a study break, a sermon break, things like that, I'll pull out my juggling balls in my office. And every once in a while, a resident or somebody will catch me <laughs> juggling and they'll be like, what is going on in the lead pastor's <laughs> office? So that's a little bit different. I was a volleyball coach uh, for my daughter's team for a little bit over five years, mm. uh, like 13 seasons, I think uh, we did with her volleyball team. Wow. And uh, I played uh, volleyball for the University of Illinois when I was in college. And uh, I've had four kids. I tried to persuade the first three to play volleyball. I worked really, really hard because I can't coach soccer. You know, I couldn't coach tennis. Those were the things that they were in. I'm like, I'm just a sideline parent because I have no idea what's going on here. Uh, but when my fourth one, Haven, decided that she was going to play volleyball, I was like, yes, I have some competency there. So mm. it was super fun to invest in these girls from oh, fourth to ninth grade and watch them grow up and help them become good volleyball players. Yeah, and they've become great sermon illustrations from time to time. Uh, they so. have. They have. Sometimes against their will. That's awesome. <laughs> that is actually one of the dangers of being in a pastor's family is you might wind up in a sermon illustration. Yeah, my wife's even learned that a little bit on the podcast. She's like, stop talking about me. <laughs> or like her friends. I talked about how they made fun of my pants. She's like, you are not allowed to tell them those things on the podcast. I'm like, I'm just trying to be honest. So, so now the question is, are you allowed to tell the podcast that Aaron said you're not allowed to tell the podcast? Yeah, uh, yeah well, maybe. We're we'll just see digging a way. hole right now. <laughs> Next question. This isn't about me. <laughs> it's, it's already recorded. Uh, so when is juggling going to make it? Uh, in the sermon illustration, it has it? Or? You know, I should. It did early on. You, okay. you know, my first two or three years. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah I've seen the juggling oh. on stage for <laughs> yeah. sure. I've pulled it out and uh, a little less theatrics now than when I first uh, got here. I feel like it's time for a, a resurgence. You think so? I, yeah. th I feel like people need to know All right. that it's, um, it's there. I think it might be irresistible. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. Irresistible juggling. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So when you, let's say you're unwinding after a stressful day at the church is i mean what's is there something in your netflix queue is there is it always books is it do you play mm -hmm. games like what what do you do with the family or even on your own to just kind of zone out decompress so uh for me it, this is a little bit again i guess is insightful is uh, i'm kind of an achiever i'm a productivity guy and so when i go home i kind of go into home mode on productivity and so generally most of the night i'm just cleaning hanging out with my family taking care of stuff that is going on around the house taking out the trash all that stuff uh, but oftentimes, uh, the last hour of the night, we'll sit down and just watch TV and get on our phones, do social media and so forth. Right now, we're on a little bit of a binge with the game show network show, America Says. You guys know that? I'm not familiar. Nope. Mm -hmm. You know, most people aren't because it's only on the game show network if you get the game show network. <laughs> and it's really kind of a quirky and lame little game show. It's not a high budget <laughs> thing. You know, it's uh, in fact, I'm even skeptical sometimes of the research that they did to get it. But it's a really good game for playing along at home. Like you okay. can get the answers along with the TV, talk to the TV, talk to the people in the room. So whenever Kelly's knitting or we're doing laundry or family's just gathering around homework or things like that, America Says is oftentimes on in the background. <laughs> Uh, and then we're coming into football season, so uh, ah. one of the fun things our family does, we, we love to watch college sports. Yeah. Not big into pro sports, but college football, college hoops, uh, we'll, we'll have that on a lot. And college volleyball. Illinois had a pretty good season last year. Yes, the they Big Ten did. is it's like the place to watch. It is. It's dominant. It's dominant. And I love Nebraska and Illinois, but as everyone knows, Illinois a little bit more. Yeah. That's okay. We forgive you. Thanks. Well, when you're an alumni, you got to be faithful to the team, right? <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> Uh, so I have a question that kind of um, is a little more intense. Um, just talking about as you're a pastor, you're kind of pouring into a lot of people. You're the head pastor, so obviously you're kind of pouring into the entire church as a whole. And so I think in ministry, it's easy to kind of be pouring out a lot. And then I just I just wonder who's pouring into you? Who are the people that you have investing in you? I'm sure it's hard to be kind of held to a certain standard or a level of um, pouring into other people, but what are the ways that you get invested into that's a great question. You know, one of the things uh, I love, obviously, is books. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like I get discipled and invested in by great thinkers uh, all mm -hmm. around the Christian community, both in terms of leadership and in terms of theology and so forth. So uh, right now I'm reading an awful lot of N.T. Wright and I uh, really love the, the kinds of thinking that he has and the way that he's stretching me. 
Um, but I'm also involved in incredible peer groups here at Christ Community Church. Because uh, I'm not just the lead pastor, I'm, a, I'm just a regular old staff member. And so I'm constantly learning from the people who are around me. And part of being a part of a really sharp staff team uh, where people are fully invested is I get to grow based on what they're reading, based on what they're thinking, based on the ways that they're investing in me. So mm. I feel like every time I show up, I get invested in and I learn. Uh, I've got a governing board that really takes care of me and uh, helps me to be able to be asking the questions, who is your mentor right now? In fact, my very, uh, this last era, um, I was very well invested in by Julie, who is our uh, consultant for our uh, Beyond Belief uh, campaign. She was tremendously helpful. Julie Bullock, who's got married and her name is now Julie Earp. Mm. Uh, just a tremendous uh, help to me. And the board recognized, hey, that's coming to an end, so who's going to be your next mentor? And they've selected and found one here in town that I have not yet met, but I'm looking forward to walking into a new era of a guy who's kind of an expert in uh, organizational culture and dynamics that's going to mm. help me lead better. Mm. So that's a, a new piece. The other thing I would say is I'm very well connected with large church pastors here in town. Uh, we meet together at least once a month, and then large church pastors in the Christian Missionary Alliance. And so these guys are my peers, but they're also my go-tos. So when I go, oh, I don't know how to solve this problem, I got about 15 friends that I could call based on you know what they're good at, mm -hmm. and they'll help me work through issues based on their expertise. Good. Uh, it's t talking about the board and governing board, I think there's also this thought, at least I've heard it from people, that because you are the lead pastor, you know, that we think in corporate terms that you're the CEO of this place and whatever Mark Ashton says <laughs> goes. Yeah. Are there any, and we know on staff that that's not true, but right. it's hard to really help people see that and how the, the church government works and things like that. So are there any like conversations or, or times where you're like, man, I really wanted to run after something like Mark and my, my convictions and things like that, that uh, I got steered away or corrected by, by the governing board uh, of elders just to help people see and even talk more about what that, that dynamic looks like and the checks and balances inside of, inside of the church. Because I think that's probably one of the, from what I've heard from people, one of the biggest misunderstandings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of what it means to have the title lead pastor and, and what it means to have governing boards and elders and things like that in place. Yeah, that's really true. And before we get into a specific example, there really are some churches where the lead pastor is the boss. You yeah. know, it's kind of more of a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. There are some that are congregational model that are very democratic in the way they go about doing things. Uh, the way we're led is an elder-led model. So I'm one of about a dozen people that sits around a table and I have an equal voice uh, for those 12 people. But if there are things that are out of place, you better believe these guys, uh, and these women and these men will speak up and they will help me to be able to get on the right track. So there have been multiple times that that's happened. Uh, there have been a few times where I wanted to make a hire, and then the governing board interviewed that person, and it became obvious that that would have been a disaster uh, to be able to do that. So they've helped me stay out of the ditch in that regard. I remember one time, for, for one example, this was probably five years in here, uh, Christmas fell on a Sunday, and we were trying to figure out what are we going to do for Sunday. My uh, inclination on that was after we put together five or six Christmas Eve services that we're going to go all crazy on, we do not want to come back on Sunday morning. I didn't think you know anybody from the church would want to come back on Sunday morning after all of those services. Plus, our staff team has put in maximum output. Let's just create a resource for people to have church at home, You know, mm -hmm. a video resource or some small groups, help teach people how to do that, do it at home. And uh, I got outvoted 11 to 1 on that vote oh, with wow. the board. It was like everybody said that's a bad idea except for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And they said, no, we're going to have people that will show up on Sunday morning. They're going to want to have church on Sunday because it's Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I said, I bet we won't. And then a thousand people showed up <laughs> oh, that wow. Sunday morning. We did wow. one service and we said, we're just going to do one service at 10 o'clock. We're going to make it simple. And uh, I was just totally wrong. And uh, the board helped to, you know, help to guide that decision. But that was the worst outvoting that I've gotten by the board <laughs> was an 11 to 1 Christmas Sunday vote. That's it. Wow. Yeah. yeah, we know, like, even for this podcast to get on the air, there's checks and balances. Like, we 
we talk to you about it, but there's also this, we have to talk to the governing board and elder board to make sure that they're okay with what's going out there and trusting us and, and all those kind of things. And so even going through some of those processes as a staff member, it's good to see, Hey, just cause Mark likes an idea. doesn't mean it's a yes or a no, uh, no but, true. and just sitting in the room with, with those people and having them bounce questions off of us, things I hadn't thought about from a pastoral mindset as business leaders, as lawyers, as, mm-hmm. uh, as, dads and fathers that are a lot further along it's been a beautiful process to gain a lot more information and wisdom and so mm. i would love to to sit around that table i think it's it's a beautiful thing that you get to sit around that table and, and have those people pouring into you so yeah, that's cool. great because we have great people around the table we've got business leaders we've got professors we've got accountants we got lawyers and uh, all of them love Jesus, and all of them have great leadership experience. And their job is to take good ideas that come from the staff, make them even better, and help us to implement them in a way that is going to be great for the congregation. What's, they do really well at it. What's the best way to get to know those people? Do we have any like meetings or anything like that that happens monthly or anything <laughs> like that? Great, that's where, a great question, Where we Alex. can have those people uh, <laughs> pray for us or just dialogue with those those people? Yeah, this is one of the shifts that we've made uh, about a year ago here at the church is creating an elder prayer meeting that happens once a month on Wednesday nights, uh, second Wednesday night of every month. And the idea is that these are not just business leaders in the church, but these are spiritual leaders. Yeah. And uh, they want to be faces that are accessible for the entire congregation, for all the staff. And if you say, man, I'd just love to have a context where I could get together, pray with them, sit at a table beside them, and meet them as real people, uh, that can happen uh, once a month on Wednesdays. And it's been a delight to do these prayer meetings. So yeah, thanks for the plug. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. I don't, th- I don't know that a lot of people know. I mean, we announce everything, right? right and so right. there's never an excuse to not know everything, anything, but everybody doesn't know everything because there's a lot going on here. And so I think that is one of the beautiful things that's shaped up in the last year. So. I love it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. How do you deal with negative feedback? I, you've probably got, you could probably, you can't name them obviously, but you could probably name them in your head. There's people mm-hmm. probably that are going to consistently be critical. Mm-hmm. And how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, is it, is it just something where you just got to be gracious with them? Or I guess the other side of this question is how do you keep from letting that affect you? Mm. Yeah. You know, there's uh, part of the role is there are large volumes of critical feedback. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some of it is extremely helpful. And so I think part of what I have to do is I have to say, I'm willing to learn from anybody, anytime. And uh, whether it's the source of somebody who's always complaining about stuff or somebody who's brilliantly insightful and makes good choices, I always try and approach it with a learning mindset and ask not what, who is the source of the criticism, but is it credible? Is what they're saying good? And sometimes I've gotten some really good ideas from some of our most uh, critical people. Uh, sometimes you say, how do I keep it from affecting me? Well, sometimes it's honestly, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, you take it back in the back room and joke with somebody, you know, about not, you know, not naming the person, but joking about the feedback and be able to take it all in stride and, uh, be able to move forward, uh, from that regard. Is there anyone that you, as far enough removed that you could share that is the most ridiculous critical feedback you've gotten (laughs) if not we understand but i'm curious if there's anything that would just blow people away be like what yeah so this is uh, i can go back to the first year of our church it was when we were uh first talking about the risks initiative as a as a disciple making uh paradigm for us and one of the things that we did is we took all those poster slots that are around the church and we put examples of disciples who we thought embodied these are risks disciples And uh, we had great people from, we really went for a diverse group of backgrounds that were there. And what shocked me was how upset people got about certain people that were on certain posters. So for Mm. example, we had Mother Teresa up there and there were some people who said, you know, we can't tolerate the idea that there's a Catholic person who is a risks disciple. Mm. And I think Mother Teresa is an amazing disciple, that she's mm. going to be in heaven and we can learn an awful lot from her. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were some people who were very upset about that. We had Jimmy Carter up there. Some people were upset that we had a Democrat that was on there. We had uh, Martin Luther King Jr. up there. And some people were upset that there were African Americans. And wow. so we had a number of people who brought these, what I would call ridiculous pieces of feedback. And for me, it created what I would call a disciple-making opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> so when somebody comes with a ridiculous, you go, okay, this is a chance to teach people that 
men and women, black and white, rich and poor, Republicans, Democrats, this is not what makes a disciple. A disciple is somebody who's a follower of Jesus that's following passionately. And we can learn an awful lot of these people from these people who are in different categories than we're in. That's good. That's good. I'm curious. I think, you know, we catch glimpses of this uh, on Sunday mornings and services, or if, if we run into you in different things that you lead, maybe the men's group or, or other things like that, of like your heart and what, what wakes you up to keep doing this, to deal with criticism, to have to put a sermon together on a Sunday and do a funeral on a Monday. What keeps you going, you know, despite all of that, despite um, ups and downs and church attendance and changes and in, in all of that crazy leadership uh, failings that have happened here at, at the church in the past, um, even seen some of your mentors from other churches fail. And, and what keeps Mark Ashton uh, going and, and fed and wanting to lead uh, this church as part of, of Christ's bride? Um, I would say the first thing, you know, what keeps me strengthened in the times of storms is really just the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit living inside of me. Because there are many times that I come to the end of my human ability to handle a situation. And there are times when I go, I, I would really rather not show up to work tomorrow because I know, I know what's facing me there. Uh, and I know I have to get up and go and tame the monster, whatever, whatever the monster of the day is. But it really is the power of the Holy Spirit that's at work in me that gives me the strength to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the wisdom and uh, the vision for being able to do the right thing. Uh, a big piece of being a lead pastor is you have to have a lot of hard conversations and you try and have them really well. And I've learned about ha ma making, having uh, good hard conversations over the years. But I also feel like it's not just a set of skills. There's a whole intuitive factor that's involved there that's just how the Holy Spirit is leading at the time. And so I try and walk in always with one ear open to God and one ear open to the conversation that I'm having and live in that kind of uh, one foot in two worlds with everything that I do. The th other thing that I would say keeps me going is I'm so passionate about the mission. Like I really, really, really believe to the core of my being that eternity hangs in the balance for whether or not we are uh, impacting our community, reaching lost people, helping mm -hmm. people to grow in their faith, raising kids right, putting marriages back together again, uh, taking uh, uh, justice and resources to the far corners of the city and the far corners of the world. I really, 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 really believe that what we do matters for the sake of the world. Mm -hmm. And we may be only one tiny little bit player in, in God's kingdom, yeah. kingdom and God's economy. I mean, mm -hmm. he's huge and we're tiny. But man, for the tiny little lives that we have, I want to make uh, the very best with the hours and the days that I have. Mm -hmm. And so being on mission for me is really important. And that, that keeps me rolling when times are tough. Good. Uh, one thing that we talked about earlier in some other podcasts is just like celebrity pastors um, and just pastors who are kind of hold up very um, highly regarded and kind of almost like as an idol. And so I just want to ask you, what are some things that we can do as a church or as Christians to kind of fight against making the pastor the main attraction? I, I feel like I've seen in other churches where the pastor is the main attraction and then if he leaves, everybody else leaves and it's just kind of like the church is built around the pastor. How do we, how do we fight against that? And, and how do you feel in, in a position that could be made into an idol basically? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's actually kind of funny because uh, I think most people, me included, view ourselves as a lot more ordinary than other people do. Mm. You know, you get put into certain roles that are out there. So of course I came to Omaha from just very ordinary middle management and another church and uh, relatively unknown status to a place where I, anywhere I could be in public, some Somebody might know who I am. Mm -hmm. I remember one time we were going down the uh, elevator at the West Roads Mall, and uh, I was saying to Kelly, it's like these voices in my head are telling me blah, 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 blah. And I was using it metaphorically, mm -hmm. not psychologically. But Kelly turned to me and she said, you can't say that in public. I mean, you never know who's watching you and who's going to talk about, you know, you're, you're a psychopath because you have voices yeah. that are in your head. <laughs> and uh, so I argued back with her. I'm like, oh, come on. We are in a, 
elevator in the West Roads. I mean, who is going to hear this? And no kidding, we got off at the bottom of the escalator, and the woman turned out in front of us turned around and said, Hi, Pastor Mark, I've been wanting to meet you. Oh, <laughs> my and God. Like, and the voice is in your head. <laughs> and the voice is in your head, exactly. So uh, it really is true that anywhere we go, we've had times where we're in restaurants, and the people next to us at the end of the meal will tell us that they know us from church, and it's like they could have been overhearing anything that we said, and it, it could have been really creepy. So... Uh, so you say, how, how can other people uh, help with that? Number one thing is just keep Jesus as the hero. Uh, I think that's what all of us need to do is say, look, this church is built on Jesus. The church was around uh, for 85 years before I got here, mm-hmm. and I hope it's going to be around for 85 years after I leave. And uh, Jesus was the king at the beginning. He's going to be the king at the end. I'm just an interim staff member who's here on a journey for a little while. And uh, I hope to do my very best to use the gifts that I have in a way that uh, honors God, but for everyone to make Jesus the hero. The other thing I think that's really important is for everybody to connect in community with people that they can have intimacy with Mm -hmm. and can grow in their faith with. That way, whether lead pastor comes or goes, uh, the community is still there for them. And the truth is that your spiritual growth is far more dependent on community than it is what happens on the stage. Mm. And this is why we're so passionate about our DNA that we do life together and community is our middle name. And so if we can help everybody to be connected in community where their spiritual vitality is coming from a small group of people where they, you know, people they know, people they love, people they serve, man, all of a sudden your identity is first and foremost in Jesus, then in your community, and the lead pastor kind of f- fades into the background, and that's a, that's a healthy place to be. Mm. Good. What's, uh, what's something you can look back at and you can say, I, I failed here. This is something I failed at. Uh, and also, I guess, what did, you, what did you learn from that? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of things. I'll tell you what, what's the highest volume failure, the most public failure uh, that we had. There's, there's just been so many, you know, so many conversations that I've failed at, so many times I've had to go back and, you know, repent for, for being cranky or powering up or other things in a, a particular situation or another. So I would say my, uh, my path at, Christ, at, at Christ Community is littered with failure. Uh, but the one that was probably the most obvious in public was our multi-site strategy. So a number of years ago, back in 2010, we cast this big vision for a multi-site strategy. We actually launched four uh, different campuses and, uh, you know, had a ball with launching those campuses. And we got to the fourth one, and the fourth one was supposed to be in Council Bluffs, and it was just, it was not going well. And we kind of had to have a, you know, uh, forgive the expression, a come to Jesus moment for uh, (laughs) our governing board to ask ourselves the question, are we really good at this? And this is after you know dropping about a million dollars towards a strategy that we thought was going to be the future of the church. And uh, what was happening is we were planting churches without a lot of initiative from the church. We were kind of reactively planting churches, and they were going really healthy and going really well. And you know we loved those people, we loved the fruit, and then we were being very proactive about our multi-site strategy, and it was okay. You know it was just it was doing fine. But we go, man, if we're going to invest our resources somewhere, what would be the smart thing for us to do? And so we kind of pulled back on the Council Bluffs launch. We planted our uh, Sarpy campus. We continued jail and online as ministries uh, of the church. And we basically said, we're moving out of the uh, business. We're going to kind of uh, business of multi-siting. We're going to cut our losses and instead focus on the church plants. Uh, that God really seems to be blessing and and blowing wind into. And so we've continued with more of a church planting strategy than a multi-site strategy since then. Uh, And it sounds pretty perfunctory right now, but when you're in the middle of it and you're talking about hundreds of lives and a million dollars and all the things that you invest to try and make impact, uh, it was was hard to admit, we're just not that good at this. Good. Uh, So we've talked about this a little bit on the podcast, like our our main target and our, our audience is is thinking through millennials and generation z and how do we reach people you know that are on the youtube generation that are listening to podcasts and we love everybody else that does it, it's not against them but as we're thinking about programming this <laughs> gen it, x is fine yeah yeah, and, yeah. yeah. It, it's, baby boomers cool yeah it's yeah. thinking about how to how to you know help people that are wrestling through questions maybe things that are uncomfortable in their heads and just open open the can to have dialogue about some of these things and so Mm. as you think of and you have kids in both these demographics i think as you think of millennials and generation z and the future of the church um a lot of 
stuff's been dumped on millennials and Gen Z as if they're like, the church is going to just fail, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden because they're a part of the world. And what are the things that make you hopeful in what you've seen in maybe even your kids and your kids' friends' lives and uh, just studies on, on the generations that make you really excited about the future of the church? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So what's, what's fun is I get you know, a front seat in my kids' lives and in their friends' lives and our student ministry here at Christ Community. And I get to meet these kids who are enthusiastically on fire for Jesus, that they're willing to share their faith, they're willing to take risks, they're willing to go on missions trips and pray boldly for the sake of the kingdom. Mm. And I love getting in environments where these kids are leading the way. And uh, I have a huge amount of hope for the way the future is headed. Uh, I look at our residents here, you know, we got people like Rachel that are just full of hope and promise and passion for the sake of the kingdom. And uh, I think there's going to be some things that they do along the way that are better than what the last generation did. Uh, One of the things that's just true about our culture now is that technology is speeding the pace of change and our ability to reach people in ways that were uh, unheard of, unthinkable. And it's not only changed a lot, but it's still changing faster than it ever has before. And so what you have with uh, millennials and Gen Z is people who swim in that water. Like that's their natural environment. So for me, podcasting is something that's brand new. You know, it's, wow, this is wild. For somebody who's a teenager, they're like, well, I can't remember a time when there wasn't podcasting. Yeah. And so they swim in those waters and they know how to navigate those in ways that are uh, gonna be better than ours. Uh, you know, I, I know Haven, for example, my 16-year-old can barely remember a time when there wasn't an iPhone. And, uh, you know, I remember the invention of it and how it's changed life and all that kind of stuff. She has a hard time thinking of what life without, without an iPhone uh, might look like. And so you just go there in their natural environment. So we have to invest in that generation because they're the ones who are going to have to swim through the streams of reaching the next generation in ways that are unthought of by people in the past. I kind of want to piggyback on that question. And when you're looking to the future, what do you think the actual church will look like? Do you have, I mean, if you were to put your prophet hat on here, like, do you, are we still meeting in a building? Are we, are we putting VR helmets on and going into (laughs) virtual reality? Like, do you have, uh, any idea where you think it, it could head or is the the format that it's in now just that it's all it's kind of always worked and that's where it'll be yeah i think one of the key components of a church is community and i don't think there's ever going to be a replacement for meeting together face to face whether it happens in a building or in people's houses you know large venues small venues i'm not sure what that's going to look like but i don't think there's going to come a day when a gathering place or an assembly of the people of god is going to become unnecessary Uh, I love the model that there is in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, we talked about it this week, where they met in the temple courtyards on uh, uh, Sunday on the first day of the week and then house to house. And I think that that model is going to continue on for a long, long time. What we do see a lot of changes now that I think will accelerate into the future is that people are time shifting. Uh, They're getting their education from different uh, venues. So it used to be, let's say you go back 100 years ago, the pastor was the only educated person in town. And the only entertainment that they had was singing and preaching on a Sunday morning. So everybody gathered, not just because of the spiritual benefits, but because it was kind of the happening thing to do uh, Mm -hmm. on a week-to-week basis. Well, now, you know, you can download all of your favorite preachers uh, on YouTube. And if you say, man, I'm a, an Andy Stanley fan or I'm a T.D. Jakes fan or whatever it is, you can get not only a great preacher, you can get your favorite great preacher all week long. And so what the content that I deliver as a pastor is less important than it was, say, uh, a century ago, because I'm not the only expert they have access to. People have access to tons of stuff. Worship is the same kind of thing. You know, if you have your favorite worship band that you like to listen to, download it and listen. You, you know, it's not what you offer in church is not the musical quality, but it's the fact that we have worship that happens in community. Mm-hmm. It's really the fact of being with people that you love in an environment where you're all together, experiencing the power of God as it's multiplied in community. Uh, that makes church powerful. So mm. there's a there's a very different aspect. So I think people will continue to learn from other uh, places. They'll continue to time shift their worship experiences to fit more conveniently in their lifestyle. Um, but I don't think that the church itself as a, a group of people who meets face-to-face will ever go away. Mm. Mm. Uh, 
kind of going back to family life and how that collides with being a lead pastor, uh, how how do you keep that positive face on Sunday morning when there are adversities going on behind the scenes that people don't know about, whether that's a family issue or other personal issues? It seems like that would be, uh, I mean, it's one thing for the person that's going, you know, working at a retail store or something like that, who you can tell is obviously having a bad day, but when you're the pastor and you've got to go up and, and try to inspire people and life is maybe dealt you something that is really hard. Yeah. I remember one time uh, a couple of years ago, I got a news on a Saturday afternoon at four o'clock that I knew was going to be cataclysmic for our entire church. I mean, it was just really, really hard news. But I also knew that I couldn't tell anybody besides the board until Sunday night or Monday, which means I had to live through a Sunday morning faking. (laughs) And uh, to be honest, my heart was broken when I was behind the scenes. I was, you know, I was just a wreck in my office. But as far as everybody else knew, they were showing up for church as usual for an inspirational message of hope. And uh, so, you know, the how is, I don't know if there's any secret sauce to it. Ask the Lord for strength and uh, put on your best face and bring the sermon that you wrote on Friday and deliver it as you best as best you can and uh, try and help people to have the experience that God wants them to have for that moment. Uh, and then come back the next day and be honest that, hey, this is something that I was going through and I knew our church would be going through, but for timing's sake, I just had to... Mm -hmm. I had to keep it confidential. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things about being a a lead pastor is it really is a roller coaster. I mean, you have days that are just triumphant and powerful days and days that are just heart-rending, tragic days. But the interesting thing is I get the tragedy and the, the brunt of stuff usually, I don't know, one day to three months before the rest of the congregation gets it. So the, the hard part of that is that I'm on a roller coaster ride that nobody else is on at the mm. time, and so I'm trying to you know, manage things uh, in that regard. Uh, the good thing is that by the time I'm helping other people to process the difficult stuff, I've already had a day or a few weeks or a few months to process it myself, so I can walk them through a journey that's a lot healthier uh, as they process it a little bit after me. I think another thing about being a leader that's really valuable is being able to be vulnerable with with people that you're leading. So how do you figure out what's okay for for you to be vulnerable with and what's kind of not okay for you to share? Yeah, so uh, those of you who have been around know that I cry sometimes on Sunday mornings, (laughs) uh, that if you're talking about baptisms or babies in hospitals, those are like the two things that get me every single time. And there are other stories as well. And it's it's funny, it's a, a weird thing because I'm not someone who cries a lot behind the scenes, but somehow when I tell stories and particularly in a high pressure moment in public when I tell stories, the emotions just flow more freely. Uh, I'm not trying to do it. I'm not pretending it. It just kind of, that's that's the way that I'm wired. <laughs> and so um, usually the things that capture my heart that I talk about publicly are things that are of public interest. And so it's not so much super personal uh, things. Uh, if If I'm the person who's being vulnerable, usually it's okay. If it's about my life, my internal world, usually it's okay. Where I have to be really guarded is where does that impact other people? Mm. So there have been dozens of times, maybe maybe hundreds, where I go, oh, this would be a really great story for vulnerability, mm. but it puts somebody else in a light that they may not want to be put in or they may not be ready to be public about that at the time. And so you hold back on those things mostly because you say, I have to be careful about how... Uh, Whether it's my family of origin, you know, there's a great story that I could tell for my family of origin, but I have to be really careful about that. Or a hilarious thing that my kid did the other day, but I know they would be embarrassed if I said it in front of the church. So uh, you have to be really careful about how does that impact the people who are in the illustrations. Mm. So it's funny because, you know, pastors, Alex can probably uh, understand this, is you're really not sharing your best illustrations because oftentimes your best (laughs) illustrations are something that somebody else would not want you to be sharing at the time. Mm. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I mean, I, on another note, like how can how can the church body encourage you? What's what's the type of encouragement that goes a long ways? It really goes the distance for you, and it's not you know. It's I think people I think people are probably sympathetic to what goes on and sometimes the stress in your life. But what's what's a way that they can really encourage you? 
Yeah, so first of all, I would say Christ Community really is a very encouraging church. Mm -hmm. So in general, people do great. Uh, I get, you know, thank you notes or pastor appreciation gifts or things like that, that I just go, man, it's it's great. It's generous. When Kelly had her uh, brain tumor a couple of years ago, I think it's five years ago now, the church just showed up for us in cards and prayers and letters and uh, food, and it was a it was a beautiful thing. So I would say the church is doing great uh, in that regard uh, related to us. A couple of tips. One is uh, if you're going to give a compliment about a message, the most helpful thing for a pastor is to say, this is how it changed my life. Mm. Mm. Uh, if they say, you did a good sermon, that's nice, and I like the sincere compliment in that regard. But if they say, man, the Spirit worked in my life to change me this way, oh, that just fills my tank to know how God is at work in people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're sharing your faith with someone, if you're taking risks and uh, helping other people to either grow in their faith or come to know Christ, that's one of the most encouraging things as well. Uh, because pastors want to see the ripple effect. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't need to be the player. I want to be the coach and see all the players that are out on the field getting the job done. And so uh, some of the most encouraging things I hear is when people are engaged in ministry and seeing uh, cool things happen. Uh, the other thing that's very encouraging is complimenting me about one of my staff, if that makes sense, or, or telling me a compliment about one of my staff. So I've got great staff that are around. One of the most encouraging things last week was a guy who called me uh, about Mark Montaigne, who's in our spiritual formation ministry, and he showed up at a parole hearing, and just the guy who was not very religious said, I could feel, well, I'm not comfortable saying this, but I could feel the Spirit of God on him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, wow, that's an amazing that's compliment awesome. to come. And uh, for him to take the initiative to call me and say that he saw that in one of my staff, wow, that just made my day. Good. Wow. All right. Anybody else have any hard hitting questions there? I've got well, I've got one more, but I I, I want to save it in my back pocket. So if anybody <laughs> else has no no, that's great. I'm grateful for you, Mark. Grateful that you've been on here. We're looking forward to having you in the rotation more and more and talk a little bit more about some of the things you're passionate about and some of your expertise uh, that you'll bring to the table. But yeah, we thought, man, there's a lot of people that have no clue, you know, they, they get to see, you know, lead pastor on stage and see you in mainly that context. Or we just as humans, like Rachel was alluding to, we just have to sometimes give a face to God, you know, or, mm. or create idols out of people. And that's just what we do. And so uh, I think it's great for people uh, in our church to get to just hear some random things and feel like they get to know you a little bit more and appreciate you and maybe have similar interests or failings to know you failed before hmm. to know uh, what what motivates you. So thanks for coming on and, and having that conversation with us. Super glad to do it. Hopefully we get to start uh, maybe maybe it's just you and I, Mark, but a uh, string theory quantum mechanics podcast. Another podcast. <laughs> yeah. I would love that. I would love we'll that. We'll just kind of nerd out over that. that Absolutely. A lot of fun. All right. This is a really tough question. Uh, choose a baby. Traditions or access. Which worship style do you like the most? <laughs> oh, you are wanting me just to step in it with that one, aren't you? Man, oh man. You are not going to get me to say anything there. <laughs> oh, so I, close. I actually do love showing up on Sunday mornings because I get two experiences on Sunday morning that are both amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people pick one that they like better. Uh, but the truth is, if you can tolerate sitting through the sermon twice, I, mm -hmm. it is a great three-hour yeah. block to experience Yost and the choir and orchestra and then yeah. our access band, and they're very different experiences, uh, but the Spirit fills them both, and it's it amazing to have them both in one church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely show up. I mean, my family started attending CCC, or at least I did, and my wife before I became an intern and all that and went to... Uh, mostly had the experience and access until, you know, I've, I've started to be able to teach a little bit more at nine and then we always had middle school, but I've just been amazed by Steve Yost. Mm -hmm. Like as I get to watch and be in, that yeah. guy's like a wizard. He uh, is. He, that yeah. guy's got, I won't call wizard. He probably wow. has the Holy Spirit. We'll, we'll give the Holy Spirit credit. <laughs> I'm, but, I'm offended. I'm writing but, you a... But the way that he leads the congregation and, and the orchestra and all, if you've just only shown up, I think, to one of these... Uh, either of these styles and haven't shown up together, you're missing something, I think. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. for sure, try out a different time and Two space. very political answers from pastors <laughs> right there. Uh, uh, there, there we go. go. No, Not so uh, uncomfortable. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you for being here. That's awesome. I think, I th I think it's really eye-opening for people to uh, get more insight into you and realize that, hey, the pastor's human too, and that's how this mm. works. We're all about Jesus. Um, 
If you have any other questions for Mark, you could probably email him. Don't I mean, don't email the podcast email, but you could. That's podcast at <laughs> cccomaha.org. We're, we'll take your feedback. We appreciate that. You can reach out to us on social media at cccomaha. But until next week, we'll see you then. <laughs>